good? Yes. All right. Well, again, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good to be here to see all your faces and those whose faces I can't see on the on the internet and phone. Welcome as well. <clears throat> you know, we, here we are on God's Sabbath, and brethren, I think most of us, uh, surely the great majority here, who are hearing my voice, have probably been Sabbath keepers for many years. I know uh, I have since at least nineteen. Well, I to 79 straight, but even before 1979, I was sporadically keeping God's holy days. And I'm sure a lot of us are even longer than that. Some of us uh, longer in God's church. And we've kept the Sabbath all these years. And brethren, uh, sometimes I'm afraid that we begin to take the Sabbath for granted. It's just something we do. We every week we we get up, we get ready, we we go to services. You know, perhaps we have some other things that we usually do on the Sabbath, but it it week after week after week, and sometimes we can lose, I think, the beauty of the gift that God has given us. You know, the Sabbath is such a blessing. Because not only is it a time for our refreshing, you know, if left to our own devices, I think man has shown that he would just work and work and work and work to get more and more and more and more. And studies have actually shown that those who take one day a week, no matter what day, I'll grant you that, and absolutely don't work or uh you know, set aside that time, have better overall health mentally and physically than those who don't have such a such a time. But God's Sabbath is special in many ways. You know, this, because the scriptures relate that God gave his people the Sabbath, not only as an opportunity to, to rest and refresh themselves, but to serve him. And also as a reminder of two great truths in the Bible, creation and redemption. The creation note is first sounded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Let's turn there. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 2, verse 2. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh, seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Notice here it was God who sanctified it or made it holy. Man, man cannot make anything holy. Only God can make something holy. He sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. You see, God ceased from his work in creation after six days, and then he had blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. As I said, only God can make something holy. So when we start saying, well, I worship on, so I, I worship every day. Well, that's great. We should worship God every day. But is every day holy then? Did we make it so? No, because only God can make something holy. Notice the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20. Again, going back to declaring God's creation. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord 
made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day again and made it holy. Not only did God give this a, as a blessing to those who received it, but also notice for their animal, for their for their servants, for their whoever was under their direction, or the sojourner that was with them, the stranger, the even their animals. This was a unique, you know, of all the laws of the ancient uh, Mid East, from Mesopotamia, Babylonia, no other law had such provisions for animals, for servants or slaves. God blessing and setting aside of the seventh day after creation formed the basis of his demand that man should observe the seventh day as a day of Sabbath rest before your God. And again, this is, God resting from his work actually strikes us as a startling one. Notice also, it comes across even, even stronger in Exodus chapter 31, verse 17. Notice what it says here. It is a sign, the Sabbath, talking about the Sabbath, is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Now, does God need to rest? Does he need to be refreshed? But this was placed here. Well, what interestingly, that word refreshed in the Hebrew is from the same root word as nephesh. Nephesh meaning a living being, because Man was made, became a nephesh when God breathed into him the, the breath of life. And this word, this root from the root, this where we get refreshed actually means to, to breathe out. It's like God was finished and he went, ah, because he had seen all that he had made was good. He was refreshed. But, you know, the, the picture of the creator as a manual labor, laborer is one the Bible often paints. No doubt it's presented in human terms in Exodus to reinforce to us the fundamental Sabbath lesson that man must follow the pattern of his creator because that was obviously set for him. One day's rest in seven is a built-in creation necessity for individuals, as I said, families, households, and even animals. This Sabbath being set in the biblical account of creation implies that it is one of those biblical standards which are meant for all men and not just for Israel. The inclusion of the Sabbath law in the Ten Commandments underlies this important truth because the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments occupied a special place in God's Torah. Alone of all God's instructions, it was alone. Spoken by his audible voice. Notice Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying. Now, this didn't come through to Israel through Moses. It came directly from the mouth of God. It was also written by his very finger. Notice Exodus 31, verse 18. This wasn't something Moses wrote down. This didn't come secondhand. Exodus 31, verse 18. And he gave to Moses what he had finished speaking with him when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And after speaking these words with his own mouth and writing these words with his very finger, God made sure that these, these would be placed in the tabernacle ark, ark at the heart of Israel's worship. 
Notice Exodus 25, verse 16. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. If we turn to the apostolic writings or what's commonly called the New Testament, we find also that it confirms the strong impression that the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as a whole embodies the principles which are permanently valid for all men in all places and at all times. And God's instructions here, you know, the, you ask most believing Christians today, should we keep the Ten Commandments? Well, we should, we should keep the one to honor, you know, God and not have idols, surely. And we shouldn't steal. We shouldn't commit adultery. We shouldn't lie. Shouldn't commit murder. Well, how about that fourth one? No, that one's gone. Who decided that? Again, what God has made holy, did man just say, Whoops. I don't. And it, valid for all men in all places at all time. And these instructions require man to observe a regular weekly break from work. If the Sabbath, if the Sabbath, the principle of it rather, is built so securely into God's creation, then we might expect one to find signs of its ancient observance on a worldwide scale. In other words, if that was from creation, then perhaps we should see something in the ancient cultures before the time. Of Sinai. And although understandably scant, some evidence of that it does exist, particularly in the widespread, widespread acceptance of a seven day week. Interestingly, cultures across time and countries, even to this day, who are most certainly not Christian or even God fearing, have a seven day week. Why? We have a month because it's based on a lunar cycle of, of the moon. We have a year because it's based on the solar cycle of the sun. But the seven-day week, where did that come from? It's totally, if you just take it from a humanistic standpoint, it's totally arbitrary. And yet, there are from history and memorial there has been a seven day week france interestingly the the nation of france under under uh napoleon when they first uh, started the the republic uh in trying to distance itself from the from the from the catholic church did away with the seventh day week and went to a 10 day week needless to say that did not last too long was an utter failure. Again, there are uh, intriguing references to ancient Babylonian taboos on the seventh day and to a monthly festival in Babylon called, interestingly, Sabbatu. Now, their connection to the biblical Sabbath is tenuous and certainly not strong enough to suggest that the Israelites adapted their Sabbath from Babylon. No, 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 no. But they do provide pointers from a very early period of human history, brethren, to man's recognition of the seventh day as something special. Even in the Torah itself, there's only one clear reference to the Sabbath prior to the Ten Commandments, and that's in Exodus chapter 16. Let's look there. We know this well. Exodus 16, verse 22. This is where, of course, the Israelites gather twice as much manna as usual on the sixth day and are told not to look for any on the following day because the Lord has given you the seventh day as a day of Sabbath rest. Notice that. Exodus chapter 16. And by the way, this is it's way before Sinai. He said, on the sixth day, Exodus 16, 22. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. 
Notice Moses didn't have to explain what he was talking about. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there was no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people, you'd think they'd get the, the hint. On the seventh day, some of the people went out together, but guess what? They found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments, my laws? And he wasn't saying that to Moses. He was obviously saying that to the people through Moses. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. In other words, they didn't need to go out to try to gather. That was primarily the reason for saying stay in your place. Don't go out trying to gather the manna. Stay in your place. There's not going to be any manna. This is a special day. This is a day of rest. Now, the people's puzzlement, which probably accounts for their disobedience, because if their disobedience had been deliberate and clear-sighted, they probably would have been severely punished, but they weren't. God was just taking them to task, it was. It seems that Sabbath observance had fallen into disuse. Now, this isn't shouldn't shock us. Because it would have been the natural outcome of Israel's long years of forced labor in Egypt. In Egypt, sad to say, they weren't told by the Egyptians, oh, yeah, you can take a day off once a week. It's all right. No, they had to work. And they worked for 400 years. And so it's not surprising that this sort of lost, got lost in all of that. Now, it cannot be uh, ascertained that the patriarchs observed the Sabbath regularly before the people settled in, e in Egypt, but I do believe they did. First of all, for the re same reason that God told Abraham, because you keep my commandments, my ordinances, my statutes, you know, if you've kept them, what else are you talking about? Well, we may not know all of them, but I believe the Sabbath was certainly one because there's plenty of pointers to a seventh day week in early times. And the Sabbath would have provided opportunities for those times that there were acts of worship, worship which took place, such as when Abraham built an altar to God and Isaac and, and later in um, Genesis 26, Isaac does the same. Abraham does in chapter 12. I believe that this was more than likely on a Sabbath day. To discover more about the way God marked out the seventh day at creation and how he intended man to observe it, we must look at the meaning of the words bless and declare holy or set aside, which occur, which both of these words, by the way, occur, occur in the creation story and the Ten Commandments. So in brief, I'll just give you, I'll give it, I'll just give you the, the upshot. In brief, bless Bless is the language of giving, while declare holy is the, is the language of claiming. When something is blessed by God, it becomes a vehicle of his generous giving and an expression of his warm concern. When he declares something holy, he claims it for himself, taking it out of the ordinary whether it's a place, a day, an animal for sacrifice, and then declares it special, special to him, dedicated to him. This provides a clue to God's intention in requiring man to observe the Sabbath. Because when we're freed from the time-consuming everyday work, we should accept the seventh day as a blessing from our Creator, using it to recall all the goodness in God's creation, and to praise him for it. It's entirely acceptable on a Sabbath day to go out and look at God's great creation and realize how, how awesome. You look at astronomers of where they can see planets. As far as they can see, there's nothing, as far as we know or being able to ascertain, like planet Earth. This little blue marble in a otherwise 
rather austere looking universe, certainly an austere looking galaxy. And we should, it's, and recognize that, that it makes a claim on our life. As a day set aside, the Sabbath is a reminder that all time is the Creator's gift. This we acknowledge when we consciously give back to God what is a part of His anyway. This little section, this little sanctuary in time. This then is the first note that that the Torah speaks in teaching on the Sabbath. It's recognition of his, his creator and of the way he is made as a creature. Man should stop work for one day in seven, not just any one day, but the day that God has set aside, the, God, the day that God has said is holy, that belongs to him. Any attempt to work a seventh day week is therefore an affront to humanity as well as disobedience to our creator God. Now I'd like to look at the second main strand of the Bible's Sabbath teaching, that of redemption. Also featured in a list of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath law, which you've already noted in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, is re reappears in Deuteronomy, the book of the restating of the law, right by Moses right before Israel was to go into the promised land. But look at it here, brethren. Let's turn to, with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Because here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 5, uh, 12, we find a different reason given for the observance of the Sabbath. Notice what it says here. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of the cattle or your sojourner. Again, unprecedented, brethren who stays with you so that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the seventh day, the Sabbath day. Now, the difference is here, brethren. Note this. The difference is between the two accounts of the fourth commandment are important. The first in Exodus 20 is addressed through Israel, through Israel to all men and women as created beings. The second in Deuteronomy 5 is directed to Israel as God's redeemed, redeemed people. So the Sabbath is in God's signpost, as it were, pointing not only to his goodness toward all men as their creator, but also to his mercy toward his cho chosen people as their redeemer. The Torah itself uses this sign language of the Sabbath in Exodus 31, verse 12 through 17. Let's look there. Exodus 31, verse 12. Exodus 31, verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths. Notice here it's Sabbaths, indicating not only the weekly Sabbath, but also the special high Sabbaths of, that uh, God made uh, known to Israel, our, the high holy days. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, calls you my own, sets you apart, declares you holy. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. 
For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Sounds like God takes it pretty serious. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual, meaning unending covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was, as we said, refreshed. After man had spoiled his relationship with God by falling into sin, declaring him uh, in the Garden of Eden, declaring that he would decide for himself what was good and evil so that he would be like God. God himself set about repairing the damage. He did this, number one, by uh, or in the beginning to, by saving a, a man named Noah from the flood and by selecting the first man, Abraham, and then a nation, Israel, to convey his redeeming love to the world. Each stage in this beautiful redemption story was marked by a covenant sign. In, of course, Noah's case, we know that it was the rainbow. In Abraham's case, circumcision. And what better symbol of God's covenant relationship with Israel is a perpetual reminder of his redeeming love than the Sabbath. Of course, the annual celebration of Passover would act as a powerful reminder and, under, uh, uh, and, and underscoring God's covenant mercy and giving his people rest from slavery in Egypt. But the weekly Sabbath was a daily or a weekly reminder, brethren. And this would underscore the importance of redemption in the people's history. There's one other significant point in Deuteronomy's version of the Sabbath commandment that we must not miss. That's the, the prohibition of all work on the Sabbath day is followed by the expl explanatory note that your maid, maid servant or manservant and your maidservant may rest as well as you. Like I said, of all the ancient uh, Near Eastern laws that we have found from the Code of Hammurabi on, Practical concern for others is not, you know, as it's, as it's expressed in the covenant God made with Israel, is never found. So loves God's loving concern for Israel in her Egyptian slavery must be matched by the Israelite family's loving concern for those who serve them. And the Sabbath offered an ideal outlet for this practical expression of concern. Our master Jesus was especially keen to rescue this humanitarian side of Sabbath observance from the mass of callous regulations which threatened to suffocate it in his day. Notice Mark chapter 3 verse 1. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue, meaning Jesus, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether we, that he would heal on the Sabbath. Here they were. They were just waiting. I wouldn't be surprised if they brought this man in. Hey, you with a withered hand, come on into the synagogue here a minute. I want to see. <laughs> oh. We'll see if we'll see if he heals on the Sabbath. Come here. And he said to them, uh, and, and he said to the man with a withered hand, come here. And he said to them, no, knowing what they were thinking, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? They had nothing to answer and says, but they were silent. And then he looked around at them with anger. Anger because he was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand, it out, and his hand was restored. Notice here, Jesus didn't say anything. 
He didn't do anything except stretch out your hand. He didn't touch him. He didn't make a, a mud pack with his spittle. He didn't say be healed. He just said stretch out your hand. And it was healed. So they couldn't exactly claim Jesus healed. Of course, they that is what they took it to be. Obviously, this was a sign from Almighty God, and they couldn't deny it. The Hebrew scriptures go to considerable lengths to buttress the Sabbath ban on work by defining what may and not may not be done by God's people on the Sabbath day. But these prohibitions were not meant to rule out activity of any kind. Their aim was to stop regular, everyday work. Because if God set aside the Sabbath, the most obvious way of profaning it was to treat it just like any other day. And brethren, we must never be guilty of that. So when the nation was in the desert, it was enough to say, stay where he is. Stay in your home. You don't need to be out looking for manna when it's not going to be there. You don't need to be out gathering sticks for fire. You should have already done that. Exodus again, Exodus 16, 29. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Yeah, in other words, I've taken care of you. There's nothing you need to do. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. Now, when they got into the promised land, with a more settled life in view, it had to be, this rule had to be spelled out a little more specifically terms that the far the farmer or the businessman or even the housewife could understand let's look at some of these for the farmer for example let's look at exodus 34 21 exodus 34 21 six days you shall work but on the seventh you shall rest in plowing time and in harvest you shall rest in other words don't be out plowing on the Sabbath. Don't be out harvesting on the Sabbath. In other words, everything you should do, you're doing as a farmer ceases on the Sabbath. How about the businessman? Let's look at Jeremiah 17, 27. Jeremiah 17, 27. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy and not to bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and they're bearing a burden in to, to do commerce, bringing your goods into, into Jerusalem to set up shops, as it were. Then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and shall not be quenched. Again. Seems to me God takes this pretty serious. How about the housewife? Let's look at Exodus 35. Exodus 35, verse 2. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire at all in your dwelling places on the Sabbath. Now, obviously, this was in regard to the heavy burden of cooking you had to, you know it wasn't like we had the 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 electric range you could go in and just turn it on put something maybe they down there to warm it up no 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 you had to gather you know you had to build up get the fire ready let the fire get going do all the preparation that would go into that because there was no cuisinarts there was no microwaves all this was a laborious work for the for the woman and that was not to be the way it was they were to get all of that done on the preparation day so that the minimal they could do and it doesn't mean you know you're gonna either you're gonna uh, freeze to death either because you could not light a fire it's talking specifically here about food preparation as you can gather by the context now, the de now, these details may seem trivial, <clears throat> brethren, but obedience to the Sabbath law was seen as the main test of the people's allegiance to God. It was made quite clear that willful disobedience was a capital offense. 
I've read it several times. She'll be put to death. She'll be put to death. And the fate of the man found gathering wood in, in defiance of Sabbath regulations shows it was no idle threat. That, uh, that by the way, that uh, occurrence was in Numbers 1532. But on the positive side, the law was laid down, has laid down rules and guidelines for observance, that things that we should do on the Sabbath day. For example, the, the 12 loaves of the showbread, which is the Torah's version of prayer in a way, like <laughs> as, as Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. 12 loaves of showbread were put into the tabernacle and later into the temple that was changed every seven days. In other words, it was like a prayer for God to, to, you know, to, that he would feed his people, that he would. Um, and so uh, that is, a you know, something that was to be done on the Sabbath and there were special sacrifices to be offered. But above all that, it was a special time for a sacred assembly of all the people. Notice Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation, a holy, the convocation, the coming together of God's people is holy to him. He has set it aside. He has claimed it for himself. When we gather, brethren, on the Sabbath, we are a holy convocation. That's an awesome thing to think about. A holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to rest your, your Lord and all your dwelling. Now, him, if we might, you know, as some people do think that hemmed in by so many rules and regulations and with a death penalty hanging over it all, the Sabbath could easily become a day of fear, a day when the people were more afraid of committing an offense than worshiping the Lord and enjoying the weekly rest. However, this was never the case. The Sabbath was intended to be a blessing, not a burden. Above everything else, it was a weekly sign that the Lord loved his people and wanted to draw them into an ever closer relationship with himself. And those who valued, those who valued the relationship, those who valued this beautiful gift of the Sabbath, calling it a light and honorable. Notice what it is said about them in Isaiah chapter 58. Notice the blessing of those who call the Sabbath a delight, who don't look at it as a burden. Isaiah 58, verse 13. Isaiah 58, 13. If you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, whatever your pleasure is, if it's not in accordance with God's word, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not taking your own, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, where the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In other words, it's a promise. It's a done deal. That's what we can expect if we call it a delight. That's what we can expect if we honor God's Sabbath as it was meant to be. Even those on the cold fringes of the community, like the eunuch and the, and the Gentile outsider, were warmed on the Sabbath day as they were drawn into the center of God's love. Notice Isaiah 56. Let's go on and read Isaiah 56, back a few chapters, verse 1. Isaiah 56, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. 
Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who chooses the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone notice who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. Then I will bring to my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Very verse that Jesus quotes when he drives out the money changers. Brethren, nowhere, these are certainly beautiful scriptures. But nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures is there seemingly more joy expressed in Sabbath worship than in Psalm 92, which has the title, by the way, A Song of the Sabbath. Notice just for, it's good to read all of Psalm 92, but just look at verse 4. Psalm 92, verse 4. For thou, O Lord, has made me glad by thy work. At the works of thy hands I sing for joy. When we, when we keep the, the Sabbath and particularly looking at it as, from, as a reminder of the creator and the creation and the beauty of it, when we see that, we look at the works of God's hands. He says, I sing for joy. The later prophets were, however, far from blind to the darker side of human nature. They knew that a great deal of Sabbath observance by their time was a sham. Many people treated the Sabbath day more as a holiday than a holy day. An opportunity for self-indulgence rather than delighting in the Lord. Some greedy tradesmen found its restrictions an annoying irritant. Let's look at Amos chapter 8. Remember what God said about bringing a, a load of commerce in on the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. Well, notice Amos chapter 5. These greedy businessmen <laughs> said, when will the new moon be over? Amos 8, 5. When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer for sweet for sale, that we may make an F of small in other words, let's chop a little off the, yeah, it's an ephah, more or less, and a shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances. In other words, they were corrupt to begin with, and then they couldn't wait. When is this Sabbath day going to be over that I can get back in there and make some money? Cheat the people. How they had fallen. As, as God's spokesman, the prophets did not shrink from exposing such neglect and abuse, even happening in the priesthood. This wasn't just the businessman. This just wasn't the common man out on the street. The priests, notice Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26. Ezekiel. God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel has this condemnation of his priests. Ezekiel 22, verse 26, her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and clean, and they have disregarded my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. They were causing God's name to be profaned by their neglect of his law, by the neglect, their profaning of his Sabbath day. They were casting aspersions on God himself. Isaiah said, those who go through the motions of Sabbath worship with unrepentant hearts actually make God sick. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, 
Isaiah chapter 1, verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. In other words, your heart's not in this. You're bringing me lame stuff. You're bringing me marred stuff. You're going through the motions. You said your incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure it. Notice he's not saying I have against the Sabbath or convocations. It's you the way you're doing it. You're doing it. I can because he says I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. These don't mix. Your attitude, the way you're treating this, my holy time, my holy things don't mix with your attitude. He says, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. The way they were keeping them, the way they were observing them, the way they were treating them. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. The prophet Jeremiah warned, warned the inhabitants of Israel that as a symptom of rebellion against God, God's Jerusalem Sabbath breaking was going to bring destruction on the city. Notice Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 27. I think we read this earlier. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath holy and not to bear a burden, again, these trading, bringing goods in and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and shall not be quenched. And sure enough, brethren, that's what happened when Nebuchadnezzar came and there's several different uh, invasions of, of Israel and, and specifically Jerusalem. You see, the Lord has been very forbearing with his people, as I, Ezekiel said. But prolonged neglect of the Sabbath makes judgment a certainty. And when the acts of judgment fell on, fell when they went into ba uh, captivity in 586 BC into Babylon, the surviving remnant of the nation took the lesson to heart. Sabbath keeping was one of the few distinctive marks faithful Israel could keep in a foreign land. That was one thing they could do in Babylon. They couldn't go to the temple anymore. The temple was gone. They lost a lot, but they could keep the Sabbath. And it, and it assumed this extra significance. And that the, at the prompts of prophets like Ezekiel and under the leadership of men like Nehemiah, when they were able to return, when the exiles came back, they were more careful than their predecessors, predecessors in observing the Sabbath. And you can read about that in Nehemiah and Ezra. So again, the Sabbath day has a twofold significance in the Hebrew scriptures. It points to God's blessing in creation, calling all men to respect their maker's instructions by observing one day's rest from work in seven. And it points to God's mercy and redemption as a special sign of his covenant relationship with the people of Israel. Generally speaking, Hebrew uh, sages who lived outside of Judea, have stressed the creation aspect of the Sabbath teaching, while those who lived and wrote in Judea, the Holy Land, place far more emphasis on the special relationship between God and Israel in, in keeping the Sabbath. There was interestingly, uh, during uh, the first century and later, there were some uh, Judean Pharisees who denied that the Sabbath had any relevance, relevance for Gentiles at all. While the Hellenist writer Philo described the Sabbath day as the birthday of the world. The festival not of a single city or a country, but of the universe. So Philo saw it, but certain uh, Pharisees in Jerusalem couldn't see that. It is in the Judean literature of this period 
that one finds the elaborate directions about Sabbath observance, which aroused so much controversy in the time of the apostles. Just for example, there are two tractates of the Mishnah, and the Mishnah is the oral law, the oral law that supposedly Moses got from God on Sinai that he didn't write down, but then and was not to write down, but it was passed orally, and then eventually they did write it down in the Mishnah. There are two tractates or chapters like in the Mishnah are devoted exclusively to these Sabbath rules and regulations. Their main purpose is to define work. And one of these headlines, 39 different classes of work you're not to do on the Sabbath. Uh, and it, this is an attempt to show every Israelite what is and not permitted on the Sabbath. An unfortunate thing, brethren, although it may have been well intended, and I'm sure it was, this led to such hair-splitting complexities and, ev and, and evasions that ecclesiastical lawyers often differed among themselves in their own interpretations, with the inevitable result that the main purpose of the Sabbath became lost beneath a layer of mass of legalistic details. And, and, and interestingly, the, these rabbis themselves were aware of how much they were adding to the straightforward teaching of the Torah. As one of them put it, and I quote, the rules about the Sabbath are as mountains hanging by a hair, for scripture is scanty and the rules many. But even with all of that, in spite of all their rule books, the positive joys of uh, and uh, celebration never quite disappeared from Sabbath observance, because according to these same rabbis, two of the family's main duties on the Sabbath day were to praise God and to enjoy the best food and drink of all week, a special meal. It was a it was a banquet, and it, Sabbath should be a feast day. So, I got no problem with that. But Jesus did have some problems, and he confronts the Jewish leaders over these things that were actually in, in, in his time and in his time causing the Sabbath to be a burden. We know these well. But interestingly, at his trial, Sabbath breaking was not brought up as a charge. Possibly it was because the Pharisees disagreed so much among themselves that they could not make a, such a charge stick. But it's safe to say that our Lord never saw himself as a Sabbath breaker. He went to synagogue regularly on the Sabbath. He read the lesson, preached and taught on the Sabbath. He accepted the principle that the Sabbath was an appropriate day for worship. He his point of coll uh, collision with the Pharisees was the point at which their tradition departed from biblical teaching. He made this clear when he defined, uh, defended his disciples by appealing to Scripture after they had been accused of breaking Sabbath tradition by walking through grain fields and simply breaking off heads of grain and rubbing them between their hands. Ah, they're reaping. No, they weren't. Had a few grains of hand and they were just had a little snack. Hardly back-breaking work. But this was harvesting according to Pharisees. Let's look, let's look at that. Jesus really had a problem with this. On Mark chapter 2, let's look at Mark. We'll look at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, as he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. They didn't think anything about it. I wouldn't have thought anything about it. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. In other words, here David did something that was clearly against God's law. But guess what? He wasn't charged because God had mercy. God had mercy on him because they were, his people really were hungry. They were 
They may have been days without food. But he said, and, and he goes on to say, and gave it to those who were with him. He was, so what he's saying here, brethren, is you didn't charge King David, and he really did break the set, well, you know, technically, but he was doing it out of concern for a life, the life of his, his people, sustenance. And here my disciples aren't doing anything wrong, and yet you're ready to condemn them. Notice what he followed up with. He followed up with a remark that took his hearers straight back to God's creation purpose for the Sabbath. Mark 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Yes, brethren, the Sabbath was made to be a beautiful gift. A gift that points us to the creation. A gift that points us to the beautiful redemption made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And God the Father, a beautiful gift that we should never take for granted, that we should never profane by treating it just like any other day, but as a special gift and beautiful thing that it is. Here's a parable. There was a great king. He ruled a vast kingdom. And one day as he was traveling through his kingdom, he came upon in a city a man who had a woman up on a platform offering her for sale as a slave. She was his slave. And the king noticed that the woman was very beautiful, but she had been hard used. And he paid a great, he asked the, the man, how much for your slave? And the man said, thus and so. And it was a high price. But the king paid it. And he took the young woman. And he took him, her to himself. And he took her and dressed her in fine clothes. And betrothed her to himself. And he gave her a special ring. To say, this ring shows that you are mine. My special treasure. Whoever sees it will know you belong to me. And one other thing I will do for you, even though I am king of this vast realm and have many responsibilities to my people and to things, I will set aside a special day for you alone, and we will meet together, you and I. And we will have a special relationship, an intimate relationship that I have with no one else. This is the appointment of our date. Brethren, how do you think the king would react if he shows up for that date and his bride that he redeemed, that he gave the special ring to, did not show up or showed up flippantly and treated it disgracefully? I don't think I need to explain the symbols in this parable for us to see how it applies to God's Sabbath. Now the ironic blessing. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, thus you shall speak, bless the people of Israel and you shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Bless you all. Have a happy, beautiful rest of your Sabbath until we see each other again. <laughs>